This 10th year Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Allen, Chris Smith, and Mark Gibson. On this episode of DTNS, Dolby wants to make your TV speakers sound good without having to change anything or get a sound bar or nothing. The Verge reports on Google's note-taking large language model and why the problem with AI is scale. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 28th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From San Francisco, I'm Nicole Lee. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Check. Hey, did you hear OpenAI just launched its enterprise version of ChatGPT? That adds you uh, more data analysis, privacy features, things like that for, for your big enterprise level business. Let's see what else is in the quick hits. <laughs> More than 500 flights were canceled and even more delayed because of a network-wide computer failure in the UK's air traffic control system. The problem affected the system's ability to automatically process flight plans, meaning all flight plans had to be processed manually, which, as you can imagine, is a lot slower. Uh, that severely limited the number of flights that could be authorized for takeoff. The UK's national airspace controller, NATS, said it identified and remedied the fault after about four hours, but still uh, pretty widespread effects there. Uh, lots of credible Apple leaks out there today. None of them terribly surprising. We're going to get new iPhones next month. Wow. Uh, likely on September 12th. That all tracks. iPhone might get USB-C, which would be new, but also not that surprising given the EU laws coming. The least expected leak comes from Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, who says an overhaul to iPad Pro is in the works for 2024, which would be the biggest update to the iPad since 2018. He's hearing it would be the first iPad with an OLED display at 11 and 13 inches. Uh, might be a new magic keyboard that would add a larger trackpad if you want the iPad Pro to act more like a laptop. And of course, an M3 chip. Uh, expect iPads to be announced as they usually are in a separate event from new iPhones. So we'll probably get new iPhones in September. And if we get new iPads, those will come in October. DoorDash will offer a product with some language and voice processing so that restaurants can have a machine take phone orders without making employees answer the phones. Uh, they found like something like 50% of phone orders get lost because people just don't answer the phone at the restaurant. They're too busy. The service will include humans who can jump in if the automated system runs into trouble with an order, but not the humans in the restaurant, like part of the service. And of course, it can plug into DoorDash Drive, which is the company's white label direct delivery product that lets a restaurant manage its own delivery process. Tech News Taiwan reports that Asus may have shut down its Zenfone division as part of a reorganization. Now, that reorg did not appear to affect the gaming phone team, so we'll still have our ROG phones. You just won't get the Zenfone. Zenfones are loved for having flagship specs in a more compact form factor. And finally, WA Beta Info reports that the latest Android beta of WhatsApp lets you select original quality photos or videos, no compression. WA Beta Info's screenshot shows choose from gallery as an option in the document picker and specifically mentions the ability to send original quality photos and videos. This is different than the option to send HD photos through WhatsApp, which launched last month, but still compresses the image. And that's a look at the quick kits. All right, let's talk about this new Dolby feature. Uh, it's for Atmos, Dolby Atmos, uh, called Flex Connect that lets you use accessory wireless speakers along with your TV's built-in speaker to make your home theater sound better. That way you can put speakers anywhere in the room you want to. You don't have to position them just right. And they will work well with your TV's built-in speakers so you don't need to buy a separate sound bar. Dolby uses the TV's built-in microphone to locate and calibrate each wireless speaker, and they think they've got their algorithm tuned, so it doesn't matter what speakers you have and where, they can make it sound the best that those speakers are capable of. It will know the relative capabilities of each speaker, for example, so if your wireless speakers are better at bass than your TV, then it'll push more of the bass out to the wireless speakers. This is similar to Samsung's Q-Symphony, does a, does a similar thing. Sony's Acoustic Center Sync also does something like this. Dolby is demonstrating this at IFA in Berlin this week and says it will ship in TCL TVs and wireless speakers next year. Nicole, I, I, I know you're not like a big expert audiophile or anything, but you know, <laughs> uh, how, how does this strike your fancy for a home theater setup? Um, the, the thing that strikes, the, the thing that pops up to me the first and foremost is that this does require getting a new TV. 
Um, yeah. Because it sounds like the Dolby Flex Connect uh, technology, anyway, only applies to newer TVs. Like TCL, as you mentioned, will be the one of the first TV, TV manufacturers to come with t- t- technology. But um, I don't know about you, but I don't get a new TV every few years. I just have to still have the same old TV that I've had same for here. so <laughs> for the last few years. So um, me personally, I would prefer it if just all TVs have this technology versus you know. Some of the new ones, uh, but for me, I'll just get a sound bar because I'm not I'm not changing out my TV, which you know it still works fine <laughs> the way it is. So I don't know. I think this definitely probably more appeals to the people who are shopping for a new TV. But even then, yeah. I wonder about the flexibility of such a technology and um, sort of the benefit of a separate um, AV system is that you can swap out your sound bar or your speakers or whatever as technology improves. And um, I mean, maybe they'll be able to like have a little firmware update. Maybe Flex Connect will get better in the future, but I don't know. Well, that, that's the idea with Dolby is that hopefully more than just TCL puts this in, more TVs come with it. And as you buy a new TV, it comes with it. And maybe it's cheaper than buying a soundbar to just get a couple of wireless speakers. I think, Roger, where where I start to wonder is how many devices is this going to be? And even if it gets in a lot of TVs, you also have to have it in the speakers. And I think I think that those are two really good uh, uh, questions to raise because, you know, as we all know, you can't adopt a product if there's not enough manufacturers and manufacturers that might not introduce a product if they don't see enough people using so it's a chicken and egg thing. But what this does, at least in my eyes, is it does sort of standardize this sort of technology, which is, is was mentioned in the in the read. Uh, Sim- Samsung and Sony have both introduced respectively on their own platforms. It does free up people to say, hey, maybe I don't want a Samsung speaker or I don't want to be tied to Sony's uh, um, acoustic uh, 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 center sync system. And this allows a little more flexibility. The truth of the matter is, you know, 80% of the people are fine with the TV they have, uh, and they're fine with the sound that their TV produces. And when you when you get into niche or, you know, as you, you get into a higher element of people who want to select and pick and match products, they tend to they tend to either do things uh, as Nicole says is I'll just get an AV receiver that supports all the formats, plug my TV into it, you know, and then I can move my speakers and get whatever I want. Requires a lot of separate you know picking and choosing and buying and cobbling together, which I've done and then I just sold like last year uh, because it got a little too much. This allows kind of a halfway in between getting a soundbar or the simplicity of just buying a soundbar and having the audio. And then having something a little more expansive without being so complicated where you have to worry about, well, you know, I can buy from 100 different uh, loudspeaker manufacturers or I can go to Best Buy and select from these five and say, hey, this fits my room. Perfect. I don't have to figure out where the sound's going to get adjusted. Like I have an old Denon, you know, from 12 years ago that had the stick the microphone in the center of the room and will auto adjust everything for you. (laughs) But it was so kludgy. And this this promises to be well a little, ten years ago, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. A, but, that's old. <laughs> well, that, exactly. But this promises not only to take that and make it more simple, but it also yeah. s- offers a standardized or industry standard that everyone could adhere to and not have to worry. Well, this is incompatible. Well, it's not this an industry work. standard. It's Dolby's well, proprietary not. thing. <laughs> but to your Dolby, point, Dolby's yeah. not trying to keep it in their Dolby branded yeah. speakers. They're they're willing to license exactly. it out, and they're, they're good at that. Yeah, that, that's what they do. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point is that this could show up in more products. And I think that percentage of people who are not home theater aficionados who want to max out quality, but do want something probably is bigger than we think, because I think a lot of those people show up at the store and say, that looks too complicated. Even a sound bar and two, the, you know, like a 2.1 system, they're like, wait, I have to put that on, mount that on the wall. I don't want to do that. I don't want to mess with that. So being able to say like, hey, if you buy this TV, if you want a little more surround sound, you can just buy those two speakers over there and they're less expensive than the big soundbar system. Maybe you end up expanding this. It's just a matter of getting it into more products, um, which is what Dolby wants to do. And Dolby's good at that, so maybe it will. Verge's David Pierce has an article up called Google's AI-powered note-taking app is the messy beginning of something great. 
Uh, it's a look at Google's Notebook LM. That's the one they announced at Google I.O. in May. You, you might remember they announced it as Project Tailwind, but they very quickly changed it to be called Notebook LM. Uh, it trains off your own notes. So if you remember us talking about it, we liked it because it was a limited data set. This isn't train off the entire web. This is an algorithm that has been trained to be a large language model that then trains specifically on your things and gives you specific answers related to your own research. So Pierce does an excellent job, of course, at explaining his experience. I encourage you to read that full article. But a few items from it stood out to us. It only accepts imports from Google Docs right now. There are more sources to come, but it is a little limited right now, and it is in beta. For now, each source can only be up to 10,000 words, and a project can only use five sources. So again, maybe it'll expand, but right now in the beta, it's a little limited. It generates things like outlines, lists of topics, and even comes up with questions you can ask it. Answers to any questions, whether the, the ones it suggests or not, come with citations from your source material. And Pierce said, it does a really good job of identifying the bits of information that are relevant to my question. In fact, he, and apparently a lot of people that use this, really valued that more than the actual answers it gave. He was like, yeah, the answers were all right. Not anything maybe I couldn't have come up with my own, but the citations really revealed some things about my source material that I might not have seen otherwise. Uh, it also added info one time that was not in Pierce's sources. Uh, so he asked Google about that and they said, yeah, the model has the capability to bring in other information and they're trying to work out what the line is there because they know that in some cases it might be helpful. In fact, in the case with Pierce, uh, apparently it was helpful, but they want to make sure that people know when it's doing that, have some control over when it's doing that, maybe turn it off, turn it on, et cetera. And they're, they're still trying to work out where that line is. Uh, Nicole, what do you think of Notebook LM based on this? Honestly, I as I was reading this from just from a purely uh, sort of a selfish perspective, I can see this being a hugely helpful for a lot of journalists out there. And the reason is because um, I remember when I was doing a lot of reporting back in the day, I would I would uh, interview like let's say three to four different sources for a piece, and I would have to transcribe all of, all of those interviews, right? So those transcripts can be literally thousands of words long per transcript. Can you I just imagine just spitting that into this uh, software, Notebook LM, and it would just like do a little summary, do a little maybe pulling out relevant quotes from that transcript, and it would probably might, might be really useful in me doing sort of put, putting putting my, my story together. And um, not just for journalists, I'm sure like research papers in college uh, or any kind of uh, work and profession that you would use, use research in. And I think it's just so... It makes things that you would normally do already, but it will make it so much quicker and so much more efficient than uh, you just doing it yourself, you know? Yeah, Roger, you were saying you thought it might be really helpful in educational settings. I, and actually, now that I think about it, it helps in in a couple of ways. One, I was saying like uh, studying. I knew someone who was going to law school and they just had a, they had a, not just binders, they had several binders full of notes. And, you know, as you study for, you know, whether it's an LSAT or, or, or uh, whatever test you're taking, um, you know, you often have copious amounts of notes. And I can honestly say sometimes it's really hard to keep track of what's what and what's where. Having everything not just only condensed, but also parsed and being searchable and have yeah. an AI to kind of help help you search all that. and interpretable, right? Yes. It's not just yeah. a dumb search, but it's a search that actually knows like, oh, these are the kinds of things you're talking about. I, I find that compelling. And then yeah, I, that was this, sorry. Oh, go ahead. There was I'm this sorry. part in the in the story that you said that uh, the, the, the notebook software was able to pull out that, for example, speed was a crucial advantage of the story that he was researching because uh, someone else, the author of one of the papers wrote it. Because he, and because he, he quoted a bunch of executives saying that speed was uh, a key factor of spreadsheets. So uh, even though he didn't come up with it, the fact that he quoted a bunch of people in the story that mentioned it was a key um, sort of an analytic factor from the story. I mean, it, also, if you're working on a PhD and you're doing your dissertation and you have volumes and volumes of notes from your research, from you know, other, other pieces of study, this really does help. If you're an author, if you're if you're writing a book, I know you know a friend of the show, Annalie Newitz. Whenever she comes with a you know she's writing a new book, she has a lot of notes she pulls information from. 
how awesome would it be to just have that instead of like, oh, where did I write it? What did I write? And when did I write it? And how does it relate to, <laughs> to this other aspect of, say, something like archaeology or, or history? This, this is like the assistant you would hire in, in many ways to help you sort through all the stuff you've collected. Yeah, didn't, didn't Pierce call it something like, 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 it, like people at Google are calling it uh, a, a team of infinite interns <laughs> or something like that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, I would totally use this just to help sort out my life. <laughs> you know, I have so many things that could... T- it's weird because I see well, this... Oh, not- oh go ahead. I immediately thought of when you had to go through uh, probate on a Still house, going through uh, it. right? Uh, and 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 this kind of thing is like I, you need to have a lot of information collected in one place, be able to make it easily interpretable. This sort of thing can be can be really helpful. And it was interesting that Pierce noted that the Google folks just call it Notebook, not Notebook LM. And I I have a feeling that whether that's subconscious or intentional, uh, that they look at this as. A, pro, a notebook product, like instead of using notepad, use notebook so that it can take your notes and expand them. And obviously at some point it's going to have to go beyond five sources. It's going to have to go beyond Google docs, but it would be able to, to take your notes and make sense of them. I, I think that's pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, th- this could be the first big AI product for Google, not search search yeah. search has got its own path that, that it's on. And I'm sure it'll be interesting, but this feels more, more useful to me. And, I, you know, if they can offer assurances to potential customers about, you know, privacy, about like whatever you stick in there uh, stays within the confines to that account, I think they have a, I think they have a winner. Yeah. yeah. Well, folks, uh, I taught a course recently. It was just a 90 minute seminar, really, on how to make a great podcast. And if you weren't able to be part of that, we did have to limit the number of seats. We have it available at the Patreon store, uh, Daily Tech News Show, uh, pa- or sorry, patreon.com slash DTNS slash shop. Uh, so if you want to get a streamable or a downloadable version, I explain the foundational elements of product podcast producing. I share ideas, my experiences on making a podcast great, how we do our rundowns, things like that. Uh, so you can get that class, again, as a downloadable audio file or a streaming video. It depends on your preference. You can get it either way, same price for either one. And you can find that at patreon.com slash DTNS. Longtime tech reporter and analyst Benedict Evans has a post up that got kind of buzzy today. Uh, it's up there, you know, towards the top half of Tech Meme. Tech Meme described it as a look at the ethical and legal issues around generative AI, which makes things that were previously only possible on a small scale practical at a massive scale. And the scale really is the essential part of this. It's a great article. Of course, I encourage you to read the whole thing. We'll have it linked in the show notes. But for now, I want to focus on this paragraph. Evans wrote, a person can listen to a thousand hours of music and make something in that style. If a person did that, they wouldn't have to pay a fee to all those artists. So if we use a computer for that, do we need to pay them? I don't think we know how we think about that. We might know what the law might say, but we might want to change that. And then this question Evan puts forward later on, I think really brings that issue into focus. AI makes practical at a massive scale things that were previously only possible on a small scale. A difference in scale can be a difference in principle. What outcomes do we want? What do we want the law to be? What can it be? Uh, I think this is so well put. Uh, This is the difference between saying, hey, five or six friends, let's meet up at a bar and putting a notice on Facebook if you're like a hugely influential Facebook poster and having thousands of people show up at the bar. One's totally fine. The bar loves it. Nobody cares. The other is a problem that you need to plan for and treat differently. Scale makes all the difference. We obviously see that with email and spam. Uh, And I think Evans very clearly puts forward that the problem with AI is that you can't just make an allegory to what we do. You have to look at the scale as well. Nicole, what do you think of this? I think there's um, that's an interesting point he made in the article um, about Taylor Swift and uh, whether you can make it like the, you know, saying if you tell AI, hey, make this song in the style of Taylor Swift, that's one thing. Right. But if you tell the AI, hey, make a song 
based on the past 10 years of pop music, mm-hmm. it might mention Taylor Swift. It might sort of like pull some of Taylor Swift because it's, you know, she's part of the past 10 years of pop music. But it's not specifically about her. It's just like a generalized sample of the 10 past years of pop music. So if that's the case, do they have to pay royalties to the artists of the past 10 right. years? Yeah. Uh, you know, like how, like how, how, how extensive do you want to give that kind of a thing? And I do agree that like a person might be able to do it. Like a person might be able to sample, you know, some music of the past 10 years, but a, a person doing it doesn't have as much. So, so if, if let's say a person does it, they're just sampling music. You could you could argue that, right? They're not putting from a specific person, let's say. Um, but yeah, I do think the laws have to be different because it is different. Um, AI is not the same thing as a person. And, you know, yeah, I, I do think that's true. Yeah. And I I think he he does a great job of explaining in this in this article that uh, the data that it trained on is not in the model. So when you ask it to do it in the style of Taylor Swift, it doesn't look in its database at Taylor Swift songs. It's just in the model to know what that means and output things. So it's not the same as copying. It used copies to train on, but it doesn't keep the copies of them. Uh, so it, it's a whole different question than copyright at that point. And I think the scale is the place to get at it because like you said, you could say, uh, make us make a song in the style of the last 10 years of pop music. Who do you owe that to? If you say Taylor Swift, it's easy. Oh, okay. I should, if I'm going to owe anything, if we decide that you should owe anything, we know who to pay it to. Uh, although with Taylor Swift, which one are you copying? Taylor's version or, uh, <laughs> the one owned by her original label. Right. Those are two different royalty holders. Like, so it, do, it does start to get complicated there, but what if it is multiple things? What if you have changed it, the parameters, at what point do you owe any compensation to people? And what point do you not? Is it just being trained? I, I'll throw my, my opinion out and, and Roger and Nicole, you, you guys can bat, uh, bat this around. I think we need to create a very small royalty mechanism similar to what we do for songwriters. There's something called a mechanical royalty that says you don't have to get the songwriter's permission, but if you cover their song and you release it, you owe a fixed royalty to the songwriter. I think we should do something like that for training data. And I think it needs to be smaller than the royalty because training data is, is infinitesimally small in its in its inclusion in the model. If you remove one song from the training data, it doesn't materially change the model. So it needs to be a smaller rate, but I think there should be a mechanical rate set for, if you're in the training data, you're not really being copied, but let's give you something for the privilege of them using your data to create their model. I think for me as well, the question comes to what what does the person using the AI, like what are they using the final result for? Like, are they using the sample to release actual music that they're selling? Are they using the the result of the 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 art that they create through the AI? Are they like selling it through commercial means? Is it kind of an educational thing? So that's definitely part of it, right? Like, so I, I do agree that if it's a commercial use of some kind, I do think some kind of royalty somewhere needs to be put in place. Otherwise, the, you, you, you know, think not just because I was saying the creator of the model should have okay. to pay a, a bit of a royalty. You're thinking the user of the model also might yeah. need to pay something if they're selling something. I think that that's starts to get tricky though. I, know, I think, I, don't know. I mean, I, again, if you're like very clearly copying, you know, sugar of bts uh then yeah you're gonna you're gonna owe something uh to them but if you're doing something that's a little you know less identifiable i don't know roger what do you think i mean it's it's one of those things where there are so many instances where you can think of well they should be they should be compensated for this should be compensated for that um I think there's merit to to both you uh to yours and nicole's suggestion in in that a mechanical license but i'm wondering if that just applies to um and like like a, a, to any anyone who who picks up this data like you have to use this particular set of data for example well, if you're there could be data that's in the yeah. public domain just like there's yeah 
There's well, an that's what I'm thinking. Like, so yeah. is there is is there a limit? Is there a lifetime to this? I think that's my, a good question. Yeah. My 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 question is: if you sample it not on the past twenty years, but everything pre 1900s, and you use that as your <laughs> your training model, and it generates works from that. Do we would we have the same? No, because those are public domain. No. I I do okay. think it would. Yeah. No. This is this is a good clarifying question. Is I do think it that royalty would have to apply to things that are protected already, not not things that are unprotected. Yeah. Um, because you know it, it it's it's such it's so complicated, and I do think that that might be one way to deal with it. But at the same time, I I agree with Nicole. It's like. The user, you know, whoever uses like when you when you use stock images, you use stock samples or whatever. You pay a you pay a small fee for it that covers the license and and, and the royalty uh, for all the stuff that you use. So you don't have to worry about it from that point forward. And I think that you know that you pay you pay to play. So if you use it in a work, you, whether it's a game, it's a novel, it's a movie. Yeah, but that again, go back to our earlier conversation. Those are cl more clear, but what if you're just using the training data to create something that's the last ten years of the images? Do they get nothing for that? I mean, like, I that that's the problem that that becomes trickier. Is like, it's it's not about. I I think current law can deal with. I created something that's exactly the same. I think when it starts to become like, well, it's in the style of, or it's kind of like, that's where it gets trickier. I guess yeah, based I mean, on that stock image example, it would be like not a real person but like an ai generated yeah like yeah you know, and not a copy but yeah. something right. that kind of looks like make that. my you know make this photo look like van gogh or right. Right, in the style exactly. of van gogh and so like sure. is is there something right now that's fine if it's in the style of van gogh you don't know, own any well van gogh is a bad example because he's public domain but <laughs> if it's in the style of scott johnson you don't own yeah. scott johnson you know oh, scott johnson anyway but when you can do scott johnson at the kind of scale that machine learning does maybe we do need a different mechanism but scott would agree i think <laughs> yeah i think so <laughs> Uh, well, folks, I'd love to hear uh, what would you do if you were the person in, in charge of setting policy? What would you recommend? Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. All right. Uh, one last story here that I think is really interesting. Uh, you might know that magnetic tape storage is not just a cool retro thing Gen Z uses to play old music. Oh, no. It has consistently provided a compact way for large organizations to make long-term backups for a long time something you don't need to access fast. You just want it reliably stored. They call it cold storage. And it's still being developed. IBM just announced its new TS-1170 drive that can store 50 terabytes uncompressed on one cartridge and up to 150 terabytes if you compress it. And that's a big jump. The previous model, the TS-1160, could only do 20 terabytes uncompressed. Uh, so I know for some of you, you might not have realized that magnetic tape storage was still a thing, which it absolutely is. Uh, and for those of you who do know and work with this, Hey, you, you've got a, a brand new, uh, IBM product that's, that's going to increase the ability to store stuff. They're still developing it. Tape is always one of the recommended long-term storage formats for, for large databases. I mean, not talking about your home, you know, two terabyte NAS. No, this is for <laughs> companies. Yeah. This is for, I, I mean, yeah, you could try to get one. It's I, a little expensive though. Um, even, even medium sized companies say, if you're like a, a in, internet facing a uh, company that deals with a lot of online clientele, you got to store that data and sure, maybe only a few years doesn't add up to much, but once you start going into yeah. five, 10, 15, that's a lot of stuff you got to keep track of. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, I say it's expensive for the individual, but for an enterprise, it's actually quite affordable. All right, let's check out the mailbag. TJ Asher liked our discussion on the extended show on Friday about whether it's better to see the movie first or read the book first. TJ wrote, I have always been and still am in the camp of movie or TV show first. The book is always better because it can explore more and go into more detail than a movie. Take Jurassic Park, a movie which holds a special place in my heart. The movie was amazing, but the entire subplot of the industrial espionage and morality of genetic engineering was represented by one silly scene and a single line of dialogue by Jeff Goldblum. The exception that proves the rule is Song of Ice and Fire. The books are so ridiculously drawn out and overly detailed that the synopsis of the TV show was superior for a good portion of the story season eight excluded. 
Uh, looking forward to the next Friday quiz or debate. Uh, thank you, TJ. It threw George R. R. Martin under the bus there at the end. Oh, gosh. Uh, you don't like the uh, several pages on lemon tarts? I find that refreshing and delectable. <laughs> I really do. Actually, I really like George R. R. Martin's writing. I, I would say you still want to see the TV show first and then read the books. Some of the books still need to be written. I understand that. But the ones that are, I, I think that's infinitely preferable. Well, Nicole, first of all, where do you stand? Book or movie first? I would say book first if you can swing it. But I don't. I'm I'm not I'm not You're I'm book not, I'm not, first. I'm, not, I'm right. book first, but I'm not a hard right. line. I'm not a hard mm-hmm. line. I, you can if you Got watch it. watch a movie first, that's fine. I'm not against it. <laughs> well, uh, don't hold that against Nicole either, and go enjoy her <laughs> other fine works. Where can they go, Nicole? Uh, the easiest way to do is just go to my link tree uh, username Nicole Nerd. Excellent. Patrons, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. Dear Abby, the venerable newspaper advice column is still around and handled the question this week of whether you have to get a smartphone in this day and age or whether companies should just remember there are folks out there with their $30 feature phones. The answer may surprise you. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Sarah Lane and I are back tomorrow with more tech news. Please join us then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>